Yes, hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Pratik Day, and we'll be starting the next session, uh, which is the topic for our session is stigmata in leprosy. And we have a respected speaker and panelists, uh, and our moderator. Our moderator is Dr. Shudipta Roy. Uh, she's the, uh, currently the assistant professor in Bakura Shamanan Medical College, having numerous publications and presentations under her name. And she keeps she has a special interest in clinical dermatology. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Shudipta Rai. I'm here. It is a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, invite uh, Professor Niloy Kanti Dash to speak on the current perspectives of uh, uh, social stigma of uh, leprosy. He is a national. Uh, he's a member of National Academy of Medical uh, Sciences. He has number of publications about 80 and handful in international publication. And uh, Sir has won uh, some of the prestigious awards. And Sir has a special interest in PKDL, leprosy, and arsenicosis. Uh, over to you, Sir, for your beautiful speech. Thank you, Dr. Shudipta, for the kind introduction. I hope you all can see me. Uh, this is a session on leprosy and I understand we are going late, so I shall try to be brief. Leprosy is a disease which is uh, known uh, since ages. The thought of the disease makes a person shudder, shudder in fear and apprehension. In the past, patients were forced to leave their house and um, some of them were admitted in asylum and sanatorium some years back, leprosy patients were uh, denied from boarding a train and was a ground for divorce. Today, however, they remained with their families. But there are stray reports uh, from different quarters that they are being looked down upon. And they receive little or no support from their family. The question remains. Have we come out of the stigma? Or is it still haunting us with its fangs and claws? Stigma has got lots of ramification. Stigma may be cultural, social. It may be professional. A person may be stigmatized in the domestic front, in the workplace, by the family members, friends, neighbors, colleagues employers, he may not be given the respect he deserves. He may be disqualified from social participation. And remember, uh, stigma may not always be verbal. Sometimes subtle non-verbal cues can make a person isolated, desolated. Unfortunately, leprosy has also been attributed to all these different forms of stigma. And ignorance has played a definite role in the propagation of the stigma. Coming to the current perspective, WHO has laid down the goal of, uh, for the next 10 years, zero in terms of uh, disability in terms of disease and stigma and discrimination. I understand uh, making the world a leprosy free world may be a utopian concept, but disability prevention is tangible. Stigma alleviation is possible. Only we need that extra effort and of course, we need to identify the pattern and the diversity of the present day stigma. We have to keep in mind that disability and stigma are closely attached to each other. Stigma causes delay in healthcare seeking. Thus, the diagnosis is delayed and the chances of deformity is increased. And there are reports which has clearly suggested that deformity is one of the reasons for the prevailing stigma uh, for uh, leprosy. 
Now, if we look at the dynamics of uh, leprosy stigma, the stigma is present at different level. It's present in the community level and the caregiver level and the familial level. And of course, um, the patients are stigmatized. So at the level of patients, we as doctors, we at many times feel that a person is stigmatized. Take for example, a person in our, in our clinic in Bankura, they travel from the district of Medinipur from Purulia to our clinic. Why? Because they are afraid that uh, a person uh, who is in his neighborhood, if they know about the disease, then he might be facing or she might be facing some concerns. So this is the felt stigma. This is the perceived stigma that we feel. And of course, the same feeling comes from the patients too. So this is one aspect of it, perceived stigma. When uh, the stigma that we feel or the community level, uh, at the community level, they feel, the caregiver, they feel, and they start, uh, you know, expressing that stigma. That is the enacted stigma or the external stigma. A person not allowing a person to, uh, a leprosy affected person to uh, come to a house, not buying food from him is something enacted. And when a person is enacting in the society, the person who is having uh, the disease is experiencing that stigma. That is the experience stigma. And all this taken together, the perceived stigma and experience stigma, they make a person believe a sense of hopelessness, worthlessness, and the self-esteem is nowhere there. And he shuts himself in a cocoon. So that is internalized stigma or a self stigma. And when a person goes into that state, it is very difficult to take the person out of it. Now, uh, with this stigma, what happens? The performance of the person in the society is decreased. The person cannot contribute. The self-efficacy is down. The person is restricted from social participation. To document, to measure these stigmas, there are tools. To measure um, the perceived stigma and the enacted or the external stigma, there is a tool which is uh, being developed. It's not yet fully developed. It's the EMIC or the Explanatory Model Interview Catalog. To evaluate the uh, internalized stigma or self-stigma, the ISMI scale is being evaluated in so, uh, the leprosy. To understand the social participation, the scale of social participation or particip participation scale is there. To understand how much of stigma is prevailing in the society where we live, where we deliver our care, we from our institute wanted to evaluate that. And we wanted to evaluate all these aspects of stigma. So what we did, we developed and we tried to develop our own tool where we'll be evaluating the perceived, the internalized, the external stigma altogether. We tested the tool for validity, reliability, kind of, you know, translated that and back translated that to Bengali and the verniculus. It was the thesis of one of my student, we focused on knowledge, attitude, practice with special emphasis on stigma. And I'm going to present to you the uh, perspective from stigma, which we found in our study. Coming to uh, the 88 uh, leprosy patients uh, who uh, participated in the study, we found that a huge number of patients they lost their job. Can you just imagine a person losing the job? Uh, in uh, That was a study being carried out in 2018 and 19 because of leprosy. They were separated from the spouse. Somebody, they stayed in their home, but they were kept in separate rooms. 
the neighbors they avoid they were reluctant to go with them to sit with them so that is a grave amount of a uh, stigma which is still prevailing we uh, are not out of the stigma yet we apart from interviewing the patients also interviewed the interns who are the future doctors and the relatives who are the caregiver at home and what we found that the felt stigma the perceived stigma and experience stigma regarding you know buying food from a leprosy patient avoiding um, a person at workplace maintaining distance and not talking of social distance that we go for in covid it's almost like you know 40% 50% of them are having it the patients can perceive that perceive the stigma that's present in the society from their caregiver and what is horrendous is the future doctors they are also in the grip of the similar stigma so this is really really an uncomfortable situation if you look at the situation regarding marriage prospect even when a person is having a, a leprosy patient in the family then also the marital prospect is reduced a person who is treated and completely cured from leprosy they also uh, are not being chosen as a life partner and even the same thing happens uh, even with doctors yes it's there even 33 uh, percent of uh, future doctors they uh, would refuse to uh, marry a leprosy patient do you think the same thing will happen if a person is having a different disease different disease here comes the question of another disease like vitiligo the stigma that is there with leprosy is being percolated into another disease it's known as shet kushtho in uh, bengali so uh, the two stigma they have come alive and they come together and this is another pity that even uh, 6% of the future doctors they consider that leprosy and vitiligo are the same ignorance i have told you is the perpetrator of stigma and even in this era where we are living on electronic media we are so very advanced and still leprosy is regarded as a curse of god by witchcraft or evil spirit so this is a shocking uh, news to us and we started looking at whether uh, other parts are also having similar situation yes we found not only in the east uh, where we have conducted the study but in the north in the west and the south they are experiencing stigma though the percentage may not be the same everywhere but it's there with that uh, understanding we uh, try to explore further we try to explore the mind and the heart of the leprosy patient so we took up a qualitative study where we conducted focus group discussion on leprosy patients and we uh, found uh, some items which are relevant to stigma among the 21 free listed items and i'm going to focus on those few items which are related to stigma so sorry to interrupt you have one yes. minute left okay perfect you, i'll be, i'll be finishing it so uh, we found that the patients attributed the same thing to a bad luck that this is my bad luck which we are, why we are having this the patients 
are so very much stuck in uh, the idea that uh, what he or she is having has totally broken the self-esteem. They are scared of being isolated. So they are concealing the disease and that's why it's leading to uh, you know, prolonged healthcare seeking behavior. And that all leads to you know, deformity. The patient is not sure whether they can uh, work with other people, whether they can eat with other people. And it will be a, a crime if I don't touch upon COVID. Yes, uh, when the COVID came along, um, 2020, we took up another uh, qualitative research we, where we have uh, found out how COVID has influenced the stigma of leprosy. We found here in COVID, the doubtful cases diagnosis is hampered. So this is one way that uh, mm, it can lead to deformity and further uh, may escalate stigma. The uh, MCI chapels, the delivery of it is impaired. Dr. Pandi has told the transportation is a major issue and here also is the same. And so again, rise of some degree of deformity. ASHA workers, they were not able to perform their duties because of a stigma of COVID, which is compounding the stigma of leprosy. So to conclude, we have to acknowledge that stigma is still prevalent and what's ominous is the future doctors are in the grip of it. The stigma is everywhere. And social discrimination and marital issues are the burning problem patients try to conceal and that may compound the stigma with COVID-19, uh, the stigma is likely to increase more. The way to go ahead with is, of course, information, education, and communication. And we have to understand that uh, this stigma is in the marrow of the society. So the way to remove the stigma is not just by saying that do not stigmatize. We have to treat them early and prevent disability to uh, make them come out of the stigma. And uh, of course, this is the vision of all the um, persons who have been working with leprosy. I thank uh, the patients who had uh, you know, talked uh, to us during this research procedures and various research uh, activities that we have uh, performed. And I like to thank my co-investigator. Thank you. Thank you, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. Over to you, Dr. Shudipta. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening speech. Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you like to start the panel discussion now? Yes. I welcome all the esteemed panel panelists. They need no more introduction. They are very much experienced and esteemed in the field of dermatology. To continue the session, uh, we always uh, face uh, a number of difficulties while diagnosing, investigating, and treating the person. Now, the first uh, case is there is a clinical picture of, uh, am I audible to all, all my panelists? Yes, yes you're audible. Yes. Uh, this is the first clinical picture. Uh, here, the two girls are showing more or less same uh, type of lesion that is a well to ill defined uh, patch, hypopigmented patch over a uh, duration of three to four months. Now, my first question goes to uh, Dr. Niloy Sina, sir. Uh, what to do next or how to approach such a case? Over to you, sir. Dr. Niloy Sina, sir. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, here it is best to wait. Watch and wait. If okay. it's not an urgent matter, you have to watch and wait for another two to three months. 
in the meantime, we'll presume it as a photoreactive dermatology, dermatological problem, which is quite common. So it is a, uh, after three months, we can do it again because on the face, we cannot, uh, the sensory impairment is not always very clear, number yes. one. Number two, biopsy is not an option, immediate yes. option. Hmm. Patient might not agree. Third, facial, PT, even PTDSS, alba and some other diseases, which may persist for really long, long, long time. Exactly. So unless exactly. there is associated nerve involvement or hmm. another associated fever, we can watch and wait. Okay. I am not taking any active measures, but I'll yeah. keep the patient under surveillance. Any sir and madam want to comment on this, add to this point? Beautifully said that uh, yes. we will observe. Uh, Dr. Sudipta, I totally yes, agree, agree with Nilayda. Uh, facial lesion is a problem and uh, the sensory disturbances may be really less. Uh, there are two perspectives to it. A person seen like this in the field, obviously, um, they have got no other option but to wait and watch. But of course, if we are uh, seeing the person in an uh, institute where you have the option of, uh, you know, investigating, then we can take up investigation. But of course, as Nilwada has said, that uh, facial biopsy will be very difficult to perform. But if you have the opportunity to uh, give um, the uh, you know um, the opportunity of uh, advanced molecular diagnosis. Even a three mm punch would do with the PCR. So this is one, and I can tell you the experience of my field visit, which I have conducted for the last say seven or eight years. Uh, what is happening is um, there is uh, um, the, the field level workers. They are getting uh, some money for you know ASHA workers. They get. Uh, 200 rupees for uh, registering a case. And what I have felt that even the pityriasis alba, which Nilada has said, are being erroneously stand as Hansen's and they have started the therapy. This is an operational point of view. So we have to take care of that also. This is what okay. I have to say. Okay, sir. Uh, now the next question to uh, Dr. Shashwati, madam. Uh, your take on role in nerve conduction velocity diagnosis of Hansen, mainly pure neuropathic Hansen. Yes, uh, thank you, Shudipta. Uh, actually, uh, leprosy it mainly involves the peripheral nerve, and nerve damage uh, can manifest uh, silent neuropathy without any clinical sign or symptom, or it may present. Uh, complete uh, presentation, either atrophy or contracture or loss of sensation, what were it. And uh, we can assess the nerve function by uh, different modalities, suppose uh, monofilament testing uh, or uh, muscle, voluntary muscle testing, whatever, or cotton ball testing. But uh, functional derangement of nerve uh, can be assessed by nerve conduction study before appearance of clinical sign and symptom. And uh, yes. it is cleared from different pathological data that extensive neuropathy is already present when patient presents with clinical symptom and sign. So if we uh, do nerve conduction uh, study, so we can prevent the disability and deformity. And already Niloy has said the leprosy stigma, it is a uh, negative feeling towards the person suffering from uh, this disease. So if we do nerve, nerve conduction in subclinical neuropathy, so we can prevent clinical neuropathy. So uh, it is so uh, useful. And not only that, whether patient is having, suppose, medical treatment, but he is not responding. So what to do? Whether uh, he is going for surgical therapy or he is fit for surgical therapy, we, we also can assess by nerve conduction study. That is important. And another important assessment of therapy, whether drug therapy is efficacious or not. And another is whether when we're giving thalidomide. So but there are also sometimes neuropathy. To assess that type of neuropathy, uh, nerve conduction study, I think it should be helpful. Can I comment? Yes, why not? Yeah. Apart from what madam has said, uh, so when there is few neurotic Hansen and patient is also diabetic, so there comes a confusion whether it is a diabetic nephropathy or diabetes is the is commonly found uh, in the patients. 
So whether it is leprosy neuropathy or diabetic neuropathy, then nerve conduction study will be definitely helpful. Where there will be asymmetric and multifocal findings uh, in neuropathy in uh, uh, leprosy, whereas in diabetic it is symmetric and diffuse. In that way, it will uh, definitely help in differentiating apart from others and monitoring the treatment also. Yes. Uh, now coming to uh, Dr. Obonti, ma'am, the yes. question goes to her, that is importance of baseline bacterial index yes. at baseline and at RFP, released from treatment, in case of LL Hansen. How do you consider this thing? Because uh, we can think over, um, yes, uh, we can think over in multivascularity cases that we can continue MDT because at times we see that this is required in some of the patients. So, what is your uh, say about this thing? Oh, Dr. Thank Abhinima. you, Shudipta. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yes. Thank you very much, Shudipta. Yes, uh, baseline uh, bacterial uh, index uh, should be done wherever facility is available. Okay. But, uh, uh, of course, you are uh, specifying the situation that is uh, in case of LL. In case of multibacillar, yes. uh, in case of multibacillar leprosy, that is in case of LL or um, hysteroid leprosy or borderline leprosy, bacterial index is corroborating more rather than in case of possibacillary leprosy. And uh, this is uh, as the, in case of uh, this multibacillary leprosy or LL leprosy, the, the bacillary load is more. The chances of yield of uh, this slit skin smear or bacillary index, the chances are also more. So wherever facility is available, we can surely go for uh, bacillary in baseline BI. And you are you are giving another situation in case of RFP, release from treatment. So if if a patient has uh, released from treatment and even he or she is uh, uh, symptoms are appearing. So, differentiate from relapse and re reactions. We can go for bacillary index, rather the morphological index. So, uh, by seeing the uh, morphology of the uh, AFB, whether it is uh, solid stain or it is granular, to precise whether the bacilli are viable or non-viable. Exactly. So, this is here lies the importance of uh, bacillary index. Dr. Shudipta, uh, may I have a point to yes. add over here? I uh, totally agree with yes. Dr. Yes. With uh, wherever it's possible, we do it. It has got uh, operational uh, issues also. Now the government is saying stop the therapy after one year. And we all know after one year, most of the leptomatous leprosy, they don't come go into a remission phase. And we need to continue it uh, further. But we have to document it somewhere. How to document? If we don't have a baseline BI, then after one year, we are in no place. And then the DLO and the SLO will come to you why you are extending the therapy. So it's extremely important, especially in multibacillary cases where we expect to increase the, uh, and we are really thinking that the uh, therapy may be more than one year. It's very essential. Please get a BI done. And of course, MI is not available elsewhere. At least get the BI. If you can do it, then it's possible to extend it further and give you a valid support in your hand to extend it further. Milada, so uh, can, I add, can I add? Yes. Can I yes, add? Yes, yes, please. Yes, please. Huh. yes, so, yes, surely. Yes. So uh, we are discussing mainly the multibacillary cases. So here I want to add something that is even in uh, cases of multibacillary possibilitions, mind me, not the possibilitary cases. There are some cases where there are multibacillary cases, but the lesions are few in number. That is the possibilitation cases. There here also lies the importance of bacillary index because we might get confused whether it's a possibilitary cases or it's a multibacillary cases. So here lies the importance of uh, doing a baseline bacillary index. So multibacillary cases with possibilitions then the yield of bacillary index, chances of bas uh, yielding bacillary index is more. Here, we can uh, keep in mind that too. Okay. Then my next case is that this gentleman presented to our outdoor with this large 
to set over the lower limbs. And on further inquiry and uh, history, uh, history taking, we found that he is a defaulter of MDP, and he has suffered multiple episodes of erythema nodosum leprosum. And is for a shocking uh, history he gave. That is, he is taking uh, systemic corticosteroid about 30 milligram for last two years. And we can see that he has he is having a moon faces trya. Now, uh, Dr. Shashwati, madam. Uh, now, what to do? Actually, uh, Shudita, probably this may be a case of uh, recurrent ENL. Maybe because. Uh, we have Dr. Shashwati, madam. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So uh, I think uh, in this case, the steroid alone should not be uh, quite uh, sufficient. So you have to think about the uh, with some adjunct therapy. And uh, actually, when patient is uh, present with ENL, our main goal of treatment to control the inflammation and neuritis and to relieve the patient from pain and discomfort and to prevent the recurrence and prevent disability and systemic complication. And uh, so I think in this case, uh, though thalidomide is mo most effective drug, but uh, it is not always suitable because it has a, the, sometimes it has teratogenic effect or non-availability or uh, they are sometimes always not monitoring facilities not available. So uh, first we should go for uh, clofazamine. In this case, uh, we can start 300 milligram uh, clofazamine for uh, four to um, eight weeks if uh, necessary, or until two or three months, we can continue. Then, uh, according to uh, clearance of lesion or clinical improvement, we gradually taper clofazamine uh, 100 milligram twice for another uh, four to eight to uh, three months, we can continue. And then uh, 100 milligram can continue till uh, improvement of clinical symptom. I think. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, Dr. Svetlina, madam, uh, this question goes to you. That is, any role of combination of vaccine and MDC in uh, decreasing the severity of uh, erythema nodosum leprosa? Uh, this patient, uh, I will say, already patient is since I'm two years on steroid. Yes. So I am not going to stop the steroid abruptly because patient will land up in adrenal suppression. And uh, so I will continue the steroid. I'll, I will start with thalidomide and clofazamine both. Because okay. thalidomide is the only drug which is at par steroid which will act immediately. Clofazamine will take a long time to act because patient is already steroid dependent. And the moment you stop the steroid, it will complication and recurrence of VNL for this patient. For regarding vaccine and MDT for this patient, uh, if you're asking for this patient, not for vaccine, this patient, not for this in general. In general, yeah, there yes. are studies that they are also uh, people are. We have discussed in various uh, academic uh, forums. Vaccine uh, though decrease the severity of ENL because they have an immunomodulatory effect. So they decrease the severity and the uh, the uh, proportion of ENL cases. So we need a uh, large sample size for this, but there are reports that they decrease. Any sir or madam want to add to this okay. management of the uh, Yes, yes, yes. Avanti, please go ahead. Avanti, please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Dr. is right. Shwetilene is also right. But I am uh, considering a practical problem. That is, if uh, you are dealing uh, nowadays with this uh, steroid-dependent patient, have you uh, given clofazamine right now? Clofazamine is, uh, nowadays, it is practically not available. I think Nilayda will be uh, with me. Just go for the no, no. Actually, Abhuti, drug of choice always thalidomide. Yes, no, no. In Shash case. Shashwati, no. Hmm. now if you are planning to give clofazimine and you hmm. will see a practical problem. Now is clofazimine at that when you are planning to give clofazimine at high doses, that is 100 milligram TDS or like that. Clofazimine, huh. apart from the doses, apart from the blister plaque in MDT. Uh, <clears throat> Loose pack or commercial is practically non available. So, I will uh, take suggestions from Nilada because Nilada has done a study in medical college where with one of our PGT that is pentoxifiline. The role of pentoxifiline, I want to, in, uh, I want to request Nilada yes. to enlighten us with the role yes, of pentoxifiline. This is, uh, this
issue we are facing in many uh, many patients uh, we cannot just prescribe clopazabine because it is out of market so pentoxifilin now pentoxifilin is available no. i remember uh, maybe 4 years uh, back uh, oh, it was back. not uh, it was not available now yes, for yes, the last yes, yes, yes. one or two years it's uh, one year rather it's available and our study has proven definitely that pentoxifilin has got uh, a more uh, uh, effective role in controlling the flare of a uh, enl uh, over a long period of time clofazimin what happens after a certain period 6 weeks the effectiveness decreases but in uh, with pentoxifilin the effectiveness persists and it is a good choice when you don't have an option of clofazimin i do agree with you dr ramanti and uh, this uh, study of uh, Dr. Nilay Gajar has been published in International uh, Journal of Dermatology. So far, I remember. So it's a proven. Uh, we have uh, done our study with the PGT. The pentoxifilin has got at part, uh, part with clofazimine. So far, uh, my opinion is uh, to deal yes. with this recurrent TNL. Uh, this Thank is you, the Nilay. last case scenario. Uh, that is uh, of a trophic ulcer, which caused many difficulties to a number of patients. So it, this is uh, this case is open to all. Anyone can comment how to manage any newer modalities like injecting uh, uh, platelet-rich plasma, total contact casting. Any experience? All, sir and madam, we are open to you. May I start? Yes, surely. Yes. So. Uh... Of course, uh, as we all know, the mainstay of tropical, tropical ulcer is this offloading. First, offloading and then prevent calluses and make this area hydrated. The dressing should, should be hydrated. So, as we all know, PRP is coming up with this uh, more and more study. PRP has definitely shown this uh, beneficial role in treatment of tropical ulcer. And not, but uh, last but not the least, and recently I have studied another thing. This is platelet rich fibrin matrix. This is the role of platelet rich fibrin matrix, which has also got role in uh, dress, which is uh, given as a dressing for treating trophic ulcer. Okay. So the role of platelet rich PRFM, this is platelet rich fibrin matrix, it keeps as a dressing over the trophic ulcer. It, uh, the uh, preparation of PRFM is also easier than uh, PRP, and PRP we give it as an injectable preparation, and PRFM we give it as a dressing. So the ulcer area keep, it keeps the ulcer area moist, and as PRP it also provides this growth factor, platelet derived growth factor, endothelial growth factor, and various other growth factors, which <coughs> helps in ulcer healing. I do others. agree with Dr. Uh, Avanti. Means we have published a report uh, one and a half uh, year back where we have established PRP with what you have told rightly, uh, you know, offloading by using a plaster cast is an important tool. And we have observed that by the end of six weeks, we could observe healing. And now the thing is in PRP, you need 16 ml of blood. So you have to have either a 50 ml syringe or you have to prick the patient twice. With PRFM, your 10 ml of blood will suffice. Even 8 ml of blood will suffice. And we have started in our department a thesis yes. in which we are comparing P and, uh, with PRFM. And the good thing uh, is that, yes, operationally, it's more feasible and the person need not to be injected. And this is one another yeah. thing. Now, mind it, the injection in leprosy is not a concern because the area is already anesthetized. The patient mm -hmm. is not going to complain of pain. But of course, injection has got a chance of uh, inflicting infections. So PRFM uh, is an important thing that is coming up and we are investigating on it. Of course, when the results come up, we can uh, share with you the results. So offloading is the main issue, the crux of the treatment, offloading. Uh, thank you, my esteemed panelists, for your uh, experiences. Uh, thank the Mid-Cuticon team and uh, my faculties and PGTs of our department of Bakura Shomilani Medical College. Here I end this session on leprosy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you.